smoke of mirrors Cause I know there's a God who's real I don't need the lights to fool me Cause I have seen the God who heals I know when I ask I'll receive it Cause you're not a God who withholds I hear you say just believe me I need a holy
together and I will dwell in the hope of your love forever I am convinced that your promises will hold together and I will dwell Keep your Everything you say is life to me. I don't want to miss one word you speak. So quiet my heart, I'm listening.
watch our worship on the screen. We got a rock star preacher who won't wake us from our dreams. We want our blessings in our pocket, but we keep our missions overseas. But for the hurting in our city, would we even cross the street? But we want to see the heart set free and the tyrants kneel. The walls fall down and our land be healed. But church, if we want to see a change in the world out there, it's got to start right here. It's got to start right now. We're going to start right here. Like the brother of the prodigal Who turned his nose and puffed his chest He didn't run off like his brother But his soul was just as dead What if the church on Sunday Was still the church on Monday too What if we came down from our towers And walked a mile someone's shoes cause we want to see the heart set free and the tyrants kneel the walls fall down and our land be healed but church if we want to see a change in the world out there it's gotta start right here it's gotta start right now the Lord will start Surrender all our pride and turn from our way. He will hear from heaven and forgive our sin. He will heal our land, but it starts right here. We're the people who are called by his name. If we'll surrender all our pride and turn from our way. He will hear from heaven and forgive our sin. He will heal our land. It's got to start right here. It's got to start right now. The Lord will start right here. The Lord will start right now. It's got to start right here. It's got to start right now. The Lord will start right here. 
sing his praise aloud. Oh, wake my soul and sing, sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise So good morning or good afternoon or good evening depending on when you're watching this service. My name is Erica and I'd like to really welcome you today to our service online. Just a few notices, some of our leaders in key areas of church life have put together a video trying to outline where we might be heading in the next few months as a church. So if you haven't checked that out yet on our website or on our YouTube channel, then please do so. And if you've received a survey, then please fill it in and send it into the office as soon as you can. If you'd like any more pr any prayer for anything, if you'd like any more information on anything you've heard today or what our church is about, or you just want to get to know us a bit better, then please do get in touch. And if you want to join one of our life groups who are meeting virtually at the moment, usually by Zoom, then again, do get in touch with us and we will try and connect you in if you're interested in joining with other Christians on your journey with God. Today, we are going to be having some testimonies from some more members of our church family. We're going to be hearing from Mark Gibson, who was a missionary in Burkina Faso and still works with the Christians there to support them about an update on what is going on in that country. We'll be having worship and we'll be hearing the word which today is from Psalm 23, verse 5, and we're calling it the host with the most. But first, as we start to come into our time together, let's just come before God in prayer. I don't know what you have on your mind right now. I don't know if there is anything that you're worried about. I don't know if there's anything major going on but we know that there are situations in the world which have been difficult and which will continue to be difficult for some time. So let's recognize that we're coming to the God who holds all things in his hands. And let's recognize that he is the one to whom we need to turn. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you that you are the creator and the sustainer of all things, that we have nothing that you have not given us. We thank you that your will is sovereign and that at some point in the future, you will be exerting that will to bring justice to this world. We thank you for that, but we acknowledge that at the moment, there are some things which are not being done as your preferred will. We pray, Lord, for all those students this week who have been struggling with understanding what their grades for A-levels and GCSEs will be and what their futures might look like. We pray for those who are trying to sort it out and pray that you'll give them clarity and imagination and the ability to communicate well and to solve the problems that have arisen. And we pray, Lord, for peace and a freedom from anxiety and fear for those young people and their families. And further afield, Lord, we pray for Belarus, where um, the people are trying 
to gain their freedom. We pray that your will will prevail. And we pray for Lebanon, where the people also are struggling to free themselves of corruption and mismanagement amongst powerful factions. Lord, we pray for them. We pray for the Christians in those countries too and pray that justice and freedom will prevail. We pray, Lord, for our own country. We pray for all countries in the world which are facing big decisions at this time. We pray for scientists. We pray for organisations who are trying to deal with the COVID problem. And Lord, we say that we trust in you. We pray for them as they work hard, but we put our trust in you. That ultimately, all problems and all issues are up to you. And we say you are a good God and we pray that we will be going into this world with being sensible, but being confident. Help us to sing the confident song of Psalm 23. In Jesus' name. Amen. And I'll hand over now to a couple of the members of our church who are going to share what Psalm 23 has meant in their own lives. Hello everyone, my name is Rachel. A lot of you will know me and my husband Will and Edward who is nearly two. And most of you won't have yet met Daniel who was born at the end of June. If you don't know me you might recognise me because until a few months ago I used to lead the Sunday morning children's team at Beck. So this is my story over the last couple of years. I used to be someone who was very disciplined in my faith. I used to be really good at reading the Bible first thing in the morning before I went to work, praying each evening, making some time to talking to God and, and writing my journal. But since Edward was born, and especially since I then went back to work, I just, I found I just haven't had the time that I used to. And even when I've had time, I haven't had the energy or haven't been able to concentrate. My brain is full, as I'm sure a lot of you will identify with for one reason or another. I do still read the Bible most days, and I do still pray, but a lot of the time it seems to be the God, help me, how do I get this little boy to sleep? I've run out of ideas, kind of prayer. And yet, I found that God is incredibly kind and faithful. I've always known him with me, and he's loved me just as much, even when it's felt like I haven't been pulling my weight, as it were. And he did step in with an idea of how to get that little boy to sleep. Having said that, over the last nearly two years, when I've been missing the sort of grown-up Bible time that I used to have, what I have been able to enjoy, what Will and I both have been able to enjoy, is the time that we spend with Edward, reading his Bible stories with him, uh, watching worship videos on YouTube, and then talking about them with him. I was fortunate to grow up in a Christian home, and I've always known that God loves me, that God is there. I don't remember a time when I didn't know those things. And that's what I've always wanted for every child of Beck, uh, and now, of course, for Edward and Daniel to to grow up just knowing that God is there, knowing that they are loved, having the building blocks to then build their own faith on that. Probably the first book that Edward really took to as a favourite when he started to like books was this one. It's a children's version of Psalm 23. For ages, we read it several times a day. He finishes every line. He probably knows all the words by now. He calls it the lamb book. As you'll see, there's a shepherd and a lamb on the front. And it starts off with, God is my shepherd and I am his little lamb. His favourite page is one where it says, wherever I go, I know, that's all it says. Although the next page then goes on to say, God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love will go to. And that's been a great thing for us to talk about with Edward. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll say it to him at bedtime or when he seems a bit worried, but it's been a great book for me too. Not only is it easier, my tired brain to cope with the, a simple version of the Bible passage. But I think it really sums up my experience recently. I've not felt like I've pulled my weight in my relationship with God, but the lamb doesn't pull its weight in relationship with the shepherd. The shepherd looks after the lamb. 
and that's how God has looked after me. Cheerful, chubby Len Tiller was a man who came to our church when I was a teenager. He'd worked for many years in Israel and had researched the lives and the practices of shepherds. He came into the church wearing his robe and headdress, carrying in one hand a staff and in the other cuddling a cute replica lamb. And he told us how in a ravine where the sheep were being led, because the path was constricted, they were strung out and the shepherd would look and if he saw a sheep that had been distracted and detached, he was in danger and out of the shepherd's protection. He would sling a stone just behind the sheep, which would startle it, it would pick up its heels and rejoin the flock. He told us how the shepherd would take his staff and bend down branches, break off the ends and hold just behind him the delicious succulent green leaves, a welcome change of diet for the sheep. Well, for the sheep who were walking closest to the shepherd. And Mr Tiller's lesson was always about the great benefits of our daily lives being a close walk behind Jesus. In my early 20s, for about 12 months, I tried to walk away from God, be my own man. God wouldn't let me go. And now I can tell you, after 50 years of a full social and family and professional and church life, I've learned that lesson, sometimes the hard way. My deep inner security and sense of satisfaction depend on how closely I am walking behind Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. So where are you? Are you in the flock? And if you are in the flock, how close is your daily walk to Jesus?
Milton Evangelical Church. My name is Mark Gibson and I'm a member at, uh, at Beck and have been for a number of years. Uh, my wife and I, uh, Cheryl, served in Burkina Faso uh, for, for many years and returning in 2015. Uh, we're still engaged in ministry out there. I travel out there several times uh, a year, both to teach at the Bible school and, and work on projects relating to uh, Fulani uh, ministries. Um, Whenever I think of how uh, Beck relate to what we've been engaged in, I always think of uh, Philippians 1 verses 3 to, to 5, uh, when Paul talks to the Philippians and says, I, I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Yeah, over the years, uh, Beck has uh, journeyed with us in our ministry in Burkina uh, and many of you are aware of uh, some of the difficulties facing the Fulani church uh, at this time. Uh, earlier in the year um, I, I shared uh, uh, what the church was going through and we put out an, an appeal uh, to try and support some of those uh, Fulani Christians who are experiencing uh, persecution at the hands of different uh, uh, jihadist groups. And uh, the church is always thrilled to remember or to know that we have remembered her. You know, I think we should never underestimate the value of remembering those who are facing struggles. Just remembering may not seem an awful lot to us, but for those in need, the encouragement is, is, is a big deal. So just to kind of give you a bit of feedback on, on, on how those funds uh, were used, uh, that we were managed to 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 raise um, well we've been able to help support um, pastors and, and Christians who have had to uh, flee because of uh, activities of the likes of uh, Isis and and, and al qaeda uh, and moving them into to safe safe zones we've also been able to kind of supply uh, food uh, to some of the most needy people as well. Um, you know, one of the ministries, as I've mentioned, that I have been involved in over year, the years is, uh, is at the Fulani Bible School. And uh, now the school is closed and, and uh, for their summer break, uh, there's a number within the school that have uh, not been able to actually return to their villages because of these jihadist groups kind of present in their vicinities. And so with these funds, we've been able to help relocate some of the students for this period of time, which has been uh, an, an enormous blessing to be able to to, to do. Um, ordinarily uh, every month uh, I'm in contact uh, with the Fulani uh, leadership and I'm always amazed on uh, their prayer requests that they, 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 they can bring to me. Uh, I always think that they're going to be asking for uh, safety and, and security and peace. But one of the things they constantly ask for is that they would be wise in how they, sh they share the gospel, but also that they would have courage to continue to share the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, one of the things that we're finding uh, at the moment in Burkina is, is an increased interest in the gospel amongst Fulani, who traditionally have been very hardened against the gospel. But I think they're incredibly tired now with the violence that they're seeing uh, in an ideology that's being presented by these extremist uh, groups. 
Um, so I've said that I would kind of bring prayer requests to the church uh, this morning. Uh, and, and so let's remember our brothers and sisters in Christ you know, in Burkina Faso. You know, when one part of the body hurts and goes through difficulty, the whole of the body should experience some of, of the pains that we are able to actually kind of pray and, and identify. So let's just spend a few moments praying uh, for our brothers and sisters in Burkina Faso. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray for those who are undergoing persecution in Burkina. We ask that your hand would be upon them. We would ask that you would give them courage. We would ask that you would sustain them. But Father, that we would also ask that they would keep their eyes focused on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. And as Paul says, that they would see these short and momentary troubles as they are. And that they would keep their eyes on what is eternal. Father, we also pray for the government in Burkina Faso coming up to their elections. We pray for peace during these times. But Father, we pray that when a new government is elected, that they would figure out a way where peace could return to the country. But Father, in all these things, we ask that despite what is going on, that you would move powerfully and that your gospel would continue to have significant impact in the lives of many Fulanis living without the knowledge of Christ. Father, we pray for your church. We pray that your church would shine like a city on a hill with the truth of your word. So, Father, we commit Burkina Faso and the church into your hands. And we ask that you would do a miracle, Lord. Amen. Well, thank you for, for listening. And uh, just, just to close with really, I did briefly kind of touch base uh, with Heather and I kind of recently got uh, an email from uh, Ray uh, and Bridget as well. Please do remember kind of Ray and Bridget in your prayers as, as uh, the coronavirus just seems to be accelerating there and then the actual, uh, the stresses and strains are, are increasing uh, somewhat. Also pray for Heather. Thailand seems to have handled the coronavirus very well, but a lot of their borders are still locked down and this has increased uh, pressure on Heather. So please do pray for, for Heather as well when you have time. Thank you for listening. God bless. I wonder if you've heard of the five love languages. It's a way somebody thought up a while ago of the describing the ways that people like to express and receive love. They include physical touch, words of affirmation, acts of service, quality time and gifts. But I've always thought there should be a sixth and that one is food. Now I've mentioned before that I'm half Egyptian and whenever we used to visit our relatives, we used to be faced with a groaning table full of fried chicken and slices of aubergine, stuffed peppers, kofta, spicy meatballs, uh, tahina, flatbread, and then we'd have for afterwards those small sweet grapes they have there and juicy dates and baklava. And it would all be served with homemade lemonade or hibiscus tea. The ladies of the house would have spent all day in their tiny kitchens to prepare that food and they kept pushing more and more food on you just to show how much they loved you and how glad they were to have you there. And those meals lasted for hours. Now, why am I talking about food? Well, it's because I think as we come to verse 5 of Psalm 23, we have a change of image. We've been looking at the shepherd who looks after his flock but now I think David switches his metaphor to that of a gracious host welcoming a guest and providing for their every need. There's some question about this, commentators differ, but I personally think that that understanding fits the words of this verse better. This verse says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup 
overflows. So I think this is verse is talking here about a guest who's been given the best food, the best meal that the host could possibly give them. In David's time, if you were an honoured guest, you would be warmly greeted. You would be offered water to wash off the dust of the road and you would also be offered oil or oil-based lotions to refresh your skin and your hair before you sat down cross-legged in front of a low table to eat. Even two millennia later, that was still the custom in Israel. And Jesus actually went to dinner with a religious leader once and had to point out that he'd shown him actually quite gross disrespect by not greeting him properly, by not giving him water to wash with and not anointing his head with oil. And here oil is not a sign of being set apart or called upon by God to do a specific task as it is elsewhere for priests and kings. Here it's a symbol of generosity, of plenty, of blessing and of joy. Good times are coming and the overflowing wine cup is the same. So David here is talking about God's invitation to be with him to be welcomed and to be shown lavish hospitality which refreshes and nourishes us. So let's dig in and examine this wonderful image a bit more deeply. I've picked out five things for us to think about. First of all, the honour of the invitation that we've been given. A meal can be a deeply uncomfortable place if you don't feel you belong there and if people don't really want you there. I had the most uncomfortable meal of my life when I was at university, shy young teenager. Yes, I know, I was shy. And uh, everybody there uh, were wearing their pearls that they'd received for their 18th birthday. They were passing the port, right or left, I don't know which, I still don't know which way it goes. And nobody talked to me much. I was completely out of place. But God's invitation is a genuine one. No matter what we've done, no matter how often we've rejected his offer in the past, he wants us to come to his table. He's not obliged to offer us anything. He's not obliged to give us any more than he already has. He's actually given us life. He's given us a beautiful planet to sustain us. He's given us as human beings creativity and passion and organisational ability and ingenuity. He's given us the ability to weigh up moral choices and the freedom to exercise them. So, in fact, God is perfectly entitled just to pass judgment on us for the way that we've spectacularly and selfishly misused those gifts and rejected the person who gave them to them. And there will be a time for that. But God, in his infinite goodness and mercy, has made provision for us right now to have so much more a means of dealing with that problem of sin at the heart of us and a new kind of life in which its main benefit is him himself, his time, his attention and his care. Because when you think about it, good hospitality is about the giving of oneself. It's not about the quality of the meal that you can rustle up. And God says to us, walk right in any time. I always have time for you and I always have the resources you need. In a pretty busy and self-serving world, we can hug to ourselves the knowledge that he is always glad to see us and he's always willing to spend time with us. If you feel that church is not a place for people like you, or you feel that God could not possibly want to accept you given your past or your present, remember that it's all about the invitation. Frankly, no one deserves this invitation and this is not a VIP event that you can buy your way into. But he is asking you to come and to eat and to drink. In Isaiah 55, we have the verse, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Ah, the cost. The meal doesn't cost us anything. Coming to God's table doesn't cost us anything. But the meal does cost something. It doesn't come cheap. It cost God himself 
in the form of Jesus on the cross, his life's blood and the last breath of life in his body. It cost Jesus loneliness, misunderstanding, abuse, hatred and suffering. It cost him hunger and thirst. But if we believe that he is God and he gave himself over to those things on our behalf, we need never hunger and thirst again. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. What are we hungering and thirsting for? Are we trying to win the power game to give us a sense of security in this chaotic world? Are we searching for a love which makes us feel accepted and valuable? Are we searching for excitement or fulfilment to make us feel that our life holds some meaning? Or do we crave financial stability to make us feel safe? None of these things can guarantee what we need, but Jesus can, and he gave everything he had to make that happen. And if we've been on the road with Jesus for some time, it's worth asking ourselves whether we can still feel overwhelmed with the honour of his invitation and the immensity of his love, which was prepared to pay the cost of that meal, because that is what saves us from being proud or self-sufficient or self-righteous. It keeps us humble and passionate and wanting more to come and take part in this meal. Now, when you get invited to a party or a meal, nobody wants to be the only person dressed as a banana. In fact, nobody wants to come as the only two people. When my youngest son was on his stag do, he and his brother were the only ones in fancy dress when they went to the comedy store and they kept getting congratulated on their marriage to each other wasn't a good evening. So when we respond, when we RSVP to an invitation, we take account of the time, the place and the dress code that the host has set out. When Jesus gives us the invitation to come, to eat and to drink, he makes no secret of the fact that it's not going to be easy. He has no tricksy sales patter, there's no hidden terms and conditions, there are no penalty clauses. He's upfront about what the new life he offers will involve. He actually said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. You see, his invitation requires a choice. You can hold on to your right to live your old life your way or you can give up that right and have him direct you into a whole new life his way. You can't do both. But it's no real choice. It's like the choice between finding a mouldy old Happy Meal from McDonald's on the floor and trying to hold on to that when somebody is offering you endless home-cooked Sunday roast dinners with wonderful Yorkshires. There is no comparison. What does give you indigestion is trying to have both. And some of us need to stop trying to have our own way and trying to take the easy bits of God's way. If you accept God's new life, but you only want the easy bits, you will find yourself trapped in a world of having only the bare minimum of what God has for you. You see, no one has ever said the Christian life is easy. In verse 4, we've already seen it described how we might have to go through the darkest of dark places in our life. And the meal here, in verse 5, is served up in the presence of my enemies. I sometimes laugh when people say that faith is just a crutch. It may help me through difficult times, but God never promises to take away all the stresses and strains of life. And actually, choosing God creates a whole lot of difficulties that didn't exist before I gave my life to Christ. In fact, have you noticed that when somebody becomes a Christian, their life can sometimes seem to get harder, not easier? There are a couple of reasons for that, I think. Firstly, it's because we've chosen to nail our colours to a mast which our society increasingly doesn't like the look of. We're not going to earn a lot of applause when we say that Everyone deserves judgment and needs forgiveness from God, even when we are humble enough to put ourselves in that same category. 
people are going to find it offensive when we say that maybe allowing everyone to self-determine their morality or their gender or their sexual practices might create some problems down the line. Now, we must not set out to offend and we must continually examine and contextualise what we believe God is saying in this day and age. But we have to realise that every generation will find some aspect of biblical truth grossly offensive. The well-known preacher Charles Spurgeon, he was preaching in 1895 and it was true of his generation then. He said, the good man has his enemies. He would not be like his Lord if he did not. If he were without enemies, we might fear that we are not friends of God, for the friendship of the world is enmity to God. And let's remember our brothers and sisters in many countries, as we've heard this morning from Mark Gibson, who face opposition which takes away their freedom, their families, their livelihoods, and sometimes their lives. And let's stiffen our resolve not to dishonour them, let alone God, by being cowardly in the face of mild disapproval or ridicule. But secondly, I think this Christian life becomes difficult because when we become a Christian, we gain an enemy who really did not care about us before. David, as a young man, he only had to face the kind of predators who would attack his sheep. But once God called him to a new life and destiny, he began to face armies, kings and civil wars. When we are living for ourselves and we don't belong to Christ, we are no threat to our enemy, the devil. But afterwards, he will try to disable, disarm and discourage us in any way he knows how. His remit, Jesus said in John 10, is to steal, kill and destroy. And it's worth remembering that when we face problems in life, whether it's anxiety over exam results, as many have had recently, whether it's poor health, whether it's conflict or whether it's injustice, we need to remember who the real enemy is and that that enemy is trying to draw us away from sitting at the table with God. He wants to tell you that there is a better table where you'll get it easier and you get what you want, that God doesn't care about you anymore, that you don't have what it takes to get through this and that everyone else hates you. Louis Giglio said recently, not to give the enemy a seat at your table. The devil may prowl around like a roaring lion, as Peter tells us, but if we stay at the table with God, we have the authority in Christ to stop him from sitting down with us and spewing his lies, and the host will protect us. Finally, let's think a little bit about eating our food. Eating is quite an intimate act in the sense that when we eat something, our saliva, our stomach acid and our digestive juices start to break it down till it gets to become small molecules which can be absorbed through the walls of the small intestine into our bloodstream. And then that delivers nutrients to every part of our body. In other words, our food literally becomes part of us. We don't just eat once, we eat daily. And when we do, it gives us energy, growth and healing when we eat the right foods. If we feed on Christ by spending time talking and listening with him, meditating on his words and all the words of God in the Bible, we will be nourished and we will grow strong. We will be blessed and have a cup that is overflowing. In other words, we will have something left to give to others. As we believe more and more in his goodness and mercy through making him part of ourselves, then we will obey him more because we will trust him more. And then we'll find the blessings of putting into practice what he says and seeing how it makes life work. Not easy, but life as it is meant to be in God. Recently, I was in a situation where conflict arose. Words were said that probably shouldn't have been said and it looked like there was going to be a rift. I was there and I tried to give some perspective to different people. I tried to find some solutions and offer some help. But when I went to bed that night, I was really agitated. I knew there was a real problem still. And what I did 
as I don't always do, but I turned to the table of God. I started praying through the 23rd Psalm that we've been looking at in the last few weeks. I declared God to be my shepherd, able to provide everything that I need. I declared him able to bring peace and drive out fear and to turn away the enemy. I declared his ability to guide me in the right way to deal with things. And by the time I'd finished praying through the psalm, I fell asleep and slept like a baby. Very unusual for a me as a woman in menopause. When I woke up, I found that apologies were being made and forgiveness was being extended. And actually some people were opening up about why they were so unhappy and had said what they did. God is good. I'm not always so quick to come to God's table to receive his blessing and his provision. But when I do, it always does make a difference. So I would just urge you, whether it's for the first time or for the hundredth time, to come sit yourself down and eat and drink. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you extend that invitation to us, that none of us deserves it, but that you extend it anyway. Lord, if we have never known what it means to be welcomed into your presence, Lord, we ask your forgiveness for the things that we've done wrong which have created that barrier between us. We say thank you for Jesus. Thank you for him dying on the cross and providing the means of that becoming not a problem between us anymore. And we say, Lord, we want you to be not just our shepherd and our host, but the Lord of our life, a brand new life that will go on into eternity. And for those of us, Lord, who've been on the road a long time, who may have strayed off to another table, or may not have realised that we've invited the enemy to sit with us at God's table. We just want to say to you, Lord, we're sorry for that. We recognise it. And we say that we trust you to protect us from the enemy, to feed us, to give us what we need to drink, to bless us, to refresh us. And we say, Lord, that we want to go forward with you in giving to others out of the excess of what you've given us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on.
Let spotless righteousness The great unchangeable I am The King of glory and of grace One with himself I cannot die My soul is purchased with his blood My life is hid with Christ on high With Christ my Savior My Savior and my God One with Himself I cannot die My soul is purchased with His blood My life is hid with Christ on high With Christ my Savior and my God With Christ my Savior and my Savior Sound. Oh, may 
I there in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne Stand before you Forever he be The Lamb upon the My name is Helen and I am a part of the Beck family. So I've been going to Beck for quite a few years now, about three years on and off. I've also been traveling, working abroad, volunteering abroad. So I've loved coming back to Beck and getting to know people there. I've also been a Christian for 10 years this summer. So during lockdown, you don't need me to say how difficult it has been for so many of us. And actually I have been really quite doing okay despite everything that has happened. I'm a very get up and go person. I like being active and I like having work to do. I like being, th I like having things to do. I like being work orientated. And I have not been able to work during lockdown as many people haven't. I'm a self-employed children's entertainer, uh, performer, and um, I'm soon to be starting a new job, which is quite exciting in a school as a teaching assistant. So things are coming together now, but during lockdown, it was very frustrating. I wasn't able to work um, and yeah, was home all day didn't like that so I had to really wait on God and let him lead me and let him say Helen this is where I want you to be right now I want you to be trusting me right now you can keep working throughout lockdown you can still um, build your skills which is what I chose to do but at the same time I was really frustrated and I feel like God has helped me to vent my frustrations to him and not keep it all bottled inside. I was chatting to someone actually recently and lockdown has been a time where we've been able to, we, we've had no choice, but things that have happened in the past have come up to the surface and I have been able to surrender them to God and they're not on my conscience anymore. They're not in my head anymore. So that has been a really good time. And it's a time for us as Christians to also spread the gospel. How could that look? It could be social media. It could be visiting family that we're able to do now. We're able to stay positive in lockdown, even when we don't feel it. So I'm not saying it's easy. It's been very difficult at times. But Psalm 23 also states, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. 
Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And I can let you read the rest of the psalm. How do we respond to that psalm when everything's going wrong and we're actually not feeling okay and we're actually angry and we're frustrated and we're like, God, why is this happening? It's not fair. When I have really expressed myself to God, he has responded and it's not always in the way that we want, but he is there with us and he will respond to us. It will look different for all of us and we're all in different situations, but I guarantee he is with you and he loves you. Hi everybody, I'm Craig and I'd like to share a testimony about what God has been saying to me during lockdown. At the beginning of lockdown, I had to come back to rugby, which cut my gap year short, which was pretty demoralizing to me because it meant that I wasn't able to share the gospel to young people like I felt I was meant to be doing and it made me feel like I wasn't doing what God wanted me to do in this crucial period of time. But God did speak to me and after a few weeks of me moping about, he told me to be patient and to use the free time that I had to look into ministry situations that I could put myself into in the future. And after a few days of praying and listening to God, he revealed to me a practical degree in youth work that I could apply for. And at the same time, he got me in touch with a church in a place called Stovington down south that was willing to provide practical training as a trainee youth leader, which was just perfect for me because that means that I get a degree at the end of three years, plus three years of hands-on experience doing one of the most valuable jobs I think there can be. And after loads of discussions and Zoom meetings with this church down in Stovington, I have applied to the university and I'm currently waiting to hear back from them about acceptance onto the course. But things are looking really good and all the different contacts I've had are saying that my chances of getting in are really high. And it really feels like God is blessing this course for me. And it's an absolute blessing that God has made himself known to me during this lockdown period. It's just wonderful that I've had this, this thing to be able to look forward to. At the end of lockdown, this is going to happen. And it just feels amazing that I'm going to be able to enact God's will once again. It's really, really good. And I've been so encouraged by God during this lockdown time. I felt that even during this difficult and strange time, He is still with us. He is still with us and He's still working for our good. And he has supported me through it the whole time. And I'm sure he supported other people through it as well. Thanks for listening. Bye.